Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be here again uh, to praise God together. And uh, though it's a virtual service, yet uh, we can participate by worshiping, by agreeing in prayer as we pray and uh, as we sing songs together that we could sing to the glory of God. And I trust that you'll be doing just that with us today. We're going to start with a song this morning, Hey Now People. That's a little tune that I put together a few years ago, and it's, uh, it's declaring that God's not dead. And I want you to know God isn't dead, friends. God is not even tired. And uh, this coronavirus and everything else, he's still on the throne, he's still in control, and he loves people, and he loves you. And he can reach into your heart and soul today in a wonderful way. We have the Word of God, we have the the Spirit of God, we have what really matters in life. If you haven't noticed already that uh, we're all here for a short time, and uh, and what's most important is to have a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Savior, because He brings joy even in the midst of sorrow, even in the midst of trials, His presence can be with us. And I trust that God's presence will be with you even today as we go through the Word of God together and sing some songs. Before we sing this song, let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness to every one of us, O Lord. We live in a fallen world. We live with brokenness. And Lord, uh, we acknowledge that it is our sin that has brought us to where we are. But we thank you that there's a Savior for sin. We thank you there's a Savior that we can trust in this very day a Savior we can turn to who loves us. And as we, uh, Lord, worship you today and as we declare the greatness of God, we ask for your Spirit's presence to be upon us, to bless us, O Lord, and to reach into hearts and homes and lives. I pray for those who are fearful today, Lord, that you will, Lord, turn their eyes towards you. I pray for those, Lord, who uh, may be sick and um, perhaps even sick with the coronavirus, Lord, that they will discover that there's Jesus Christ to lean on and to turn to, that you still are a refuge and strength and a present help in time of trouble. I thank you, Lord, the Bible says that you're an anchor for the soul. And Lord, oh, how our souls need anchoring in these days as in any, any time. But Lord, we become more acutely aware and we pray, oh God, that we would turn towards you today, that we would hear from heaven and that we would discover, Lord, a place of safety and security in the midst of this storm. We ask all of this today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So we're going to sing for you right now the song, Hey Now people. I said, hey now, people, I've got something to say, singing, God's not dead, his children aren't ashamed, no, 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 hey now, people, we're not just here to play, stand up and shout it, there's power in Jesus' name, weapons. Victorious, we are in Jesus' name we go. We're not ashamed of our God to praise Him, don't you know? So give Him all the glory, yeah, give Him all the praise. Turn your heart to Jesus, your hands to heaven and raise. So give Him all the glory, yeah, give Him your heart to Jesus, your hands to heaven raise. Said, hey now, people, I've got something to say. Singing, God's not dead, his children are ashamed. No, 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 hey now, people, we're not just here to play. Stand up and shout it, there's power in He's put within our hand The Bible, the power of prayer And the Spirit helps us stand Victorious we are In Jesus' name we go 
We're not ashamed of our God We praise Him, don't you know? So give Him all the glory Oh, give Him all the praise Turn your heart to Jesus Your hands to heaven raise so Give Him all the glory Give Him all the praise Turn your heart to Jesus Your hands to heaven raise Said, hey now, people, I've got something to say. Saying God's not dead, His children unashamed. No, 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 no. Hey now, people, we're not just here to play. Stand up and shout it. There's power in Jesus' name. Well, friends, it's wonderful to know that we have the Spirit of God, we have the privilege of the Word of God to turn to, and that we can give Him all the glory that He so wonderfully deserves. This next song is a song called Build Your Kingdom Here, and it is uh, a prayer to the Lord. Lord, build your kingdom. And you might say, well, how does the Lord build His kingdom here? Isn't it the kingdom when you get to heaven? And the truth of the matter is, is that the kingdom of God is something that you can enter right now. The kingdom of God is something you enter by faith. And when you're born again of the Spirit of God, when you put your hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are born again. And that is a new birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's not about a religion. Some people think, oh, born again is a religion. No, it's about a relationship where you come into a whole new life with Jesus Christ. You die to an old way of life, you enter into a new way of life, and in this new way of life, Jesus is king, and he's king over your heart. And so you come into the kingdom of God by faith in Christ. Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with observation, but it's in your very midst. And praise the Lord that today, if you're outside of the kingdom of God, you can come in by simply putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's amazing, it's wonderful, and it's for you. So here's the prayer. Build your kingdom here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives. For your our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts release the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church and we pray revive this earth build your Show your mighty hand 
your kingdom's power Reaching the near and far No force of hell can stop Your beauty changing hearts You've made us for much more than this Awake the kingdom seed in us Fill us with the strength and love of Christ For we are your church We are the hope This next song is a, is a sweet song, and it's called Ice Can't See. And it speaks about the fact that eyes can't see the way God holds on to us. You don't see, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not real. That doesn't mean it's not effective. And in this song, it speaks about God being all over, because he is, about being all around, because he is. But then here's the sweet part of true Christianity. A lot of people say, you know, I'm going to follow God. I'll do my best. I'll try to follow him. And, and, but that isn't what Christianity is in its essence. The Christianity is, in its essence is God on the inside. You see, before you're converted, that is, you put tr your trust in Christ as your Savior, God is working from the outside in in your life. But once you're born again, once you give your life to Jesus Christ, he works from the inside out. Now, that's far greater. That is the power of God within you, changing you, transforming you, so that you are in this incredible relationship with him, and that you have the power of God in you to live the Christian life. And then, of course, and only then, can you truly follow Jesus, because you need the Holy Spirit's power to do that. On the outside, he's convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, but on the inside, he's transforming us daily, comforting us, teaching us truth, and building this incredible love relationship that we can have with him every single day of our lives, preparing us for the glories of eternity. Praise God that though eyes can't see it, it is so incredibly real. Eyes can't see the way you hold me or how I'm hidden in your heart. But the truth of the matter is, uh, it's as real or even more real than things seen. The Bible says we look at the things unseen and not the things that are seen. Eyes can't see the way you hold me Or how I'm hidden in your heart Minds don't know all you told me Or how I ache for where you are It's invisible to the world 
incredible to the angels. Not since Eden have they seen this sight. Everlasting light you are. All over you are, all round you are, inside this is life, this is life you are, all over you are, all round you are, inside this is life, this is life. Eyes can't see the way you hold me. How I'm hidden in your heart. Minds don't know all you hold me. How I ache for where you are. It's invisible to the light you are all over you are all around you are inside this is life this is life you are all over you are all around you are inside this is life this is life oh I come in Broken hearted and every piece coming captive and I leave free. Oh, I come in empty and I leave here. Bring my sickness and I leave healed for oh, broken. is life you are all over you are all round you are inside this is life this is life you are all over you are all round you are inside this is life this is life This next song we're going to play for you is, is, and I hope you sing along with us, is Good, Good Father. God is good, friends. He is a good God. And He is uh, good all the time. And sometimes we don't understand when things happen in our lives. And, we, uh, and I've heard people say, well, He can't be a very good God because this happened or that's happened. But we don't see the big picture. We don't see the whole sphere. And we're going to see in our sermon a little bit later how good God really is. 
But, you know, it's just like a father with a child. Uh, there's lots of times when the child doesn't understand and doesn't understand when a, a, a parent or father or mother disciplines a child and says, no, you can't do that or you have to go over there or you have to do this. And, 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 and lots of times children can be rebellious, can't they? And they don't have to be very big to, to be that way. And uh, when they get to be teenagers, look out sometimes, true. So, uh, because there's a miss, there's not an understanding of things. They haven't developed that far. We are like that often. And so uh, often the challenges against God's goodness are not based on truth, but just on the emotional experience of a moment. God is good, friends. He is good. And there are times when we may go through hard situations, but sometimes in the end you look back and you say, oh, that was for the good. And the Bible actually says, because God loves us and those who love God, those who are in a relationship with him, that in the end, everything works for the good to those that love God. Yes, everything. Even the darkest hours and the deepest trials. He is a good, good father. And I'd love for you to discover that. If you are listening and watching today and, and you haven't understood that yet, I pray that your eyes will be open to see that God is very good and that you would come running to him because if you come running to him, I assure you, his arms will be open wide and he will minister to you and love you and deal with your issues, with your sin, with your brokenness, bring healing and love and peace and joy into your life. He's a good, good father. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are and I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call 
me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am You are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. supposed to be here 
And this is a very steep cliff here, but the sun's been shining on this spot. And there's a little bit of green grass, and I'm, I just can't resist it. I'll be careful. It's a long way down there. I need to be really careful, but I can be careful. I'm okay. Hey, Lamy, I've been looking everywhere for you. What are you doing here? This is dangerous. Oh, I know, but, but there's green grass here, and it's very, very good. Yes, but Lemmy, you could fall, and you could be killed if you fall over this cliff. Oh, I won't fall. Lemmy, you should come right now. Come on off of this cliff. Well, I'm pretty sharp. You know, I got good feet, and I'm not going to fall. You see, I can, look, I can walk around like this and like this. Lemmy, please stop. No, I'm okay. You see, look, and I can even jump up and down, and I won't fall over. I'm too smart a lamp for, uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Lemmy, oh, 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 ah, help, help, help. I'm falling over. I don't know what to do. Please. Billy! I'm coming, I'm coming. I gotta be careful I don't fall. But, uh, oh, oh, I almost went. Oh, just a second. I'm getting you. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, Lemmy. Are you okay? Oh, oh, ah, out. Oh, Billy, Billy. Oh, 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 my goodness. Oh, oh, boy. Oh. Lemmy, are you all right? Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. But, uh, Lemmy, Billy, Billy, you, 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 you saved me. I did, but uh, I shouldn't have had to save you, but you shouldn't have been up there on this cliff. But, Millie, you could have got killed. I know. I almost fell over. I just about went. Well, but you must love me very, very much. Millie, I love you with all my heart. You're my best friend, and, uh, and I love you. And I would, have, I, would have, uh, I would have saved you even if I went over the cliff. You love me that much? I do. Oh, my goodness. And I shouldn't have been up here. It was the wrong thing to do. Oh, oh, let's get out of here quick. Yeah, well, you better rest a little more. But you know what, Lemmy? That's the kind of love that God has. Only he knew that he was going to be killed. And he didn't just love his friends. He didn't just love his best friend. He loved us while we were still sinners. That's how much God loves us. Wow. Wow. I guess I never realized how much Jesus loves us, that he would die for us, that he would be suffered in our place, even though, like me, I went the wrong way. You should have just said, Lammy, I'm going to the barn. I'm leaving you alone. I couldn't do that because I love you. That's real love, even though my love isn't perfect, but God's love is really perfect in every way. Oh boy. Well, let's get out of here before I get fall over that cliff again. And thank you, Millie. Thank you that you love me. I love you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Well, friends, um, that's God's love. God so loved you that he sacrificed himself. Jesus was sacrificed on the cross for you. That's real love. We're all falling over the cliff. We'll all perish if we don't have Jesus. And yet Jesus came to die on the cross to save you and to save me. He's full of love, real love for you and for me. Trust him as your savior now and uh, accept that love. He did everything to rescue you and you can receive him and be saved. Well, my friends, as we open God's Word today, I'm going to take you to a verse of Scripture that I'm sure that you've probably heard at least once in your life. Go to a football game and a, or, or a, a baseball game often, and you'll see, uh, as you're looking down over the plate, you'll see somebody behind waving a sign, and it's got John 3.16 on it. Now, I can admit to myself, I can say, I didn't know what that would have meant at uh, one time, but I certainly know what it means now. It is probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. And if you've been to Sunday school at all, it's probably the verse that you memorized. It's one that has stood out and it's one that has touched people's lives over the years. So I thought I would uh, spend time in this one little verse today. I'm not going to wander very much. 
and look at this verse and see, well, what does it have to say? Why is it so amazing? What is it that is about it that uh, has touched people's lives so much? Well, I can say this about this verse. It is uh, called, and for good reason, the greatest verse in the Bible. And uh, we're going to go through this and see how many great things there are in it, or great attributes. And so as we do, we're going to see how great this verse is. But remember that all the greatness that's in this verse is reflected, it's reflected in the greatness of our God. So let's pray before we open the word. Father, we pray that you'll give us wisdom. We pray that you'll give us understanding, Lord. We pray that, Lord, we will be spoken to from this verse of Scripture. We may know it so well that we pass over it. We may glibly quote it without really thinking of the words. But we ask today that we would think of every word and think about who you are, Lord. You authored this. These are directly from the lips of Jesus Christ as he explained the new birth to Nicodemus. And so, God, we ask you that by the spirit of the living God that you would open ears and hearts and souls to receive the truth from this verse today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the verse. How great is it? Well, it starts with this, for God. Is there anyone greater than God? Is there someone that you could look to and say, ah, he's greater than God? No. How is that? Because he is the divine creator of all things. Without him, there's nothing. God lived in eternity separate from creation for eternity past. And at some point, he decided to create. And in that creation, we see in Genesis chapter 1, as he spoke, worlds came into existence. As he spoke, the stars were scattered across the universe. As he spoke, <clears throat> he caused the, uh, the earth itself to form in what he wanted it to be. And he spoke animals into existence and plants and, and everything. And finally, his crowning creation, which is humanity, as he formed and shaped Adam out of the dust of the earth. You see, it's so amazing that God's intimate love towards humanity is expressed in that he put his hands on to create humanity, but he spoke the rest of it into existence. There's a personal uh, relationship that we see even there in the book of Genesis. But this is God we're talking about. He is great in his authority. He is great in creation. He is great in his power. He is great in his mercy. He is great in his love. He is great in his judgments. He is great in every aspect of greatness that could ever be imagined. What is it that you could go and see that would move you? I mean, people travel all over the world to go and see spectacular sights. I have done a little bit of traveling in my time, and uh, in, uh, I've been to the, into the Arctic Circle and seen the vastness of that area and the coldness of it and all those experiences. I have uh, seen the Badlands, and, 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 and there's a majestic beauty about those there, and Niagara Falls and, and other parts of the United States and Canada, and I've and, uh, been to you know, a few other countries as well. And I've seen some glorious things. But to look at those things, and sometimes we can be awestruck at them. And indeed, sometimes you don't have to travel very far. You just have to look out and see a beautiful sunset and be awed and amazed. But I want to tell you that God is more awesome and more amazing than all these things. God is great. He is great in his vestige, in his majesty, and all the things that you see in this world have been created by his hands. People have uh, sought to discover things in this world, and they've um, you know, investigated, and God has given us inquisitive minds. <clears throat> and if you uh, look at the Nobel Prize winners, most of them have won prizes for discovering something, not for making something, but actually discovering something that's already there like the DNA that's inside of us. And they, so they win prizes for it. But really, the one who gets, should get the prize is God himself. 
because he created DNA. He created all things. And so his greatness shines through in everything around us. And sometimes we're trying to, 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 to understand things and get to know them better and we're fascinated with them. People spend their whole lives looking to uh, understand things better and come into a deeper place with them. But all the while, the greatness of God is there. His handiwork is all around you. And so uh, when we stop and think about this, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the very creation itself glorifies God. The stars declare his handiwork. Uh, the smallest bug on the planet, God made it. God is great. He has made all things at all times and in every way. He is the fullest expression of greatness that you could ever find. And so when we stop and think about that, it starts with God. And my friend, everything starts with God. It must, because of who he is, because of his authority, because of his power. Now, what about people who say, well, there is no God. Is that going to change who God is? No. Is there evidence that God is real? Absolutely. All creation shouts his evidence. And then on top of that, we had the word of God to reveal his character. And on top of that, we have his son who came into the world, who is the very image of God. And he showed what God is like in every way. And on top of that, he revealed the salvation that he is offering to the world through his son. And God is also great in another aspect, and that is his holiness. That is God is always good and always perfect in every way. His ways are just. But what about the devil? If there is a devil, as some people might say, there is a devil, friends. There is evil in the world. You don't have to look far to find it, to find his handiwork. And so, yes, but God is greater than the devil as well. And the Bible makes it very clear that the devil will get his due. The problem is, is that if you choose to follow the devil in his ways, you'll get your due too. Because not only is God holy, but he is absolutely just. God must punish sin and rebellion because rebellion and sin goes against the very grain of God and the creation of God. And as a result of that, it brings chaos and misery and destruction. That's what sin does and it must be punished. But, but in spite of all of that, God did something. And that's where we come to the next greatness. So God is great. We can all uh, perhaps agree with that. And if you don't, well, then look a little further, dig a little deeper, and you'll discover how great he is. The second aspect, the second thing in this verse is this. God, who is great for God, so loved, so loved. This is the greatest act of all is love. God so loved. My friends, I want you to know 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. And that isn't a, you know, just a euphemism. That is the truth. God is love. And it's his very nature. It's his very character that God is love. And that, that is his, the very fiber of who he is, is love. God is love. You see, God was loved before there was anything ever here. Well, and you might say, well, how could God love if he was the only one? Because love usually requires some other person. But if you understand the word of God, you'll discover that there are three persons in the one God. And you might not fully understand that, but there are three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And I haven't got time to go through all of that today, but it's clearly taught in the word of God without question. For example, in Hebrews chapter one, the Father says to the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Father's calling the Son God. And we actually have, as well, the Holy Spirit being called God in the book of Acts. So, so even before there was creation, God had a love relationship. The Father with the Son, the Son with the Spirit, the Spirit with the Son, the Father. There was, love was present. And love is, a, is such a word. It's such an abused word in our culture that sometimes we don't understand how... Uh, um, the difference about what true love really is. True love is not just a warm, gushy feeling that you have every once in a while. True love is a love that says, I will give myself for that other person. True love is self-sacrificing. True love puts the other person ahead of yourself. 
And God so loved. This greatest act was done by the greatest person, God himself. And he so loved. This is his nature, friends. So wherever you are and you're thinking of God, I want you to really pause and realize that God loves. God loves. God loves, friends. Oh, grab that with your heart and soul. <clears throat> when I was young, you know, sometimes you have a crush on a, on a girl <clears throat> when you're a little teenager and you're wondering, does that girl love me or doesn't love me? And I can remember uh, actually stooping down to pick up a daisy. I don't know if anybody ever did this. And you pluck the, the, the little petals off the daisy. Uh, she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. And sometimes uh, you get to the end of it and you find out, oh, she doesn't love me. I'm friend, you don't have to do that about God. You don't have to wonder, does God love me? And the reason why you don't have to wonder whether God loves me or not, because it says this, for God so loved. God, the greatest person, so loved the greatest act, the world. The world. Did you get that? So does God love you? Are you part of this world? I've often said to people, I, when I was sharing sometimes from this verse, I said, um, this is what it says, God so loved the world. Does God love you? Well, I suppose, I said, are you from Mars? No. Well, God so loved the world. That includes you. God so loved the world, the greatest number of people. So God, the greatest person, so loved the greatest act, the greatest number of people. That includes you, friend. If you're wondering today, does God love me? Or how can God love me? You know, some people, uh, a lot of people feel that they're not worthy of love. Some people don't f feel like they, they hate themselves. They th if I was somebody else, if I only had a, a different nose or a different face or a different body, or, or, you know, if I was as smart as so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, then I would be worthy of love. I want to tell you the truth. The truth of the matter is, is none of us are worthy of love, but we are loved. God doesn't love you because of how you look. He made you the way you look. God doesn't love you because of, of, of even your conduct so much. He loves you because he loves you. Love is so rich and so real and so amazing. And God loves the world. This is the greatest act that we can have is to love somebody. Now, love can be so skewed in our world. And we hear people say, well, I love potato chips. Well, that's not the same as the kind of love that God is and that God has towards us. It's not the love for potato chips because you love potato chips so you can enjoy the taste of them. Or, or a young fellow saying to a girl, oh, I love you, but it doesn't mean a thing. It's only to be able to do something with that girl and not because you want to actually treat that person with great respect and to honor that person and to wait until the day that you're married in order to express that kind of love. The kind of love that says, I put the other person first in my thinking, in my heart, and in my thoughts. Love is not selfish. Of course, we have that wonderful description in 1 Corinthians 13 that speaks about love. Everybody likes to read it at weddings and, and uh, to, uh, to declare how... Uh, how, how beautiful and poetic this particular passage of Scripture is. But it says this concerning love. Love suffers long and is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not selfish. It is not provoked. It doesn't think evil. It doesn't rejoice in sin, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. Oh, my friend, that's God's love. That's who God is. God is love, and he so loves the world. That's you. So you can put yourself in that place today and say, God so loves Pierre, or God so loves Fred or Joe, whatever your name is. You can say today, God so loves me. He loves me. Oh, friends, you don't have to pick petals to find out if he loves you. He really does. And so we have this, God, the greatest person, so loved, the greatest act, the world, the greatest number of people, 
that he gave his only begotten son, the greatest gift. There is no greater gift that God could give. God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son. Now who's that? It's Jesus Christ. God couldn't give a higher gift than this. God gave his son to the world. God gave his son to a world that despised him. God gave his son to a world that would crucify him. You don't think God knew about it before he sent his son? He knew exactly what they were going to do to him. It was actually predicted and prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. It gives the details of what would happen to Jesus when he would get here. Jesus knew what he was going to come and do. He knew that he would be crucified. He said, for this cause I came into the... What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour, but for this cause I came into the world. This is the hour that I've been, been sent to do. He knew that he was going to go to that cross. He knew that he was going to be crucified. He knew that he would suffer uh, immeasurable suffering. God so loved the world that he gave... His son. He gave his son to go into this world. Jesus left the glories of heaven to come to this earth for a plan and a purpose that God had. Why would he do such a thing? Why wouldn't he just say, look, the human race is a mess. I'm going to wipe them all out and it's going to be done with. But no, he said, no, I love humanity. In spite of the sin, in spite of their darkness of sin that has pervaded their souls, I still love them and I am going to rescue them. And the way that I'm going to rescue them is I'm going to send my son. And Jesus said, here I am. Here I am. He said, he said I come to do your will, O God. That's exactly what Jesus said to the Father. I come to do your will, O God. And this is what he did. God so loved the world that he sent, he gave his only son. Now, it's not going to make sense to you of, in his giving of his son if you don't understand what he came to do. And so this greatest gift that was given be, was given because we needed the gift. Would God send his son to be crucified on a cross if, if we didn't need it? Would he do it just because, uh, out of some arbitrary reason? No, there was a real reason why his son would be crucified on a cross. He was crucified because of your sin, because of my sin, and the results of what our sin would produce is for us to be lost for eternity. And so God so loved the world that he gave his son to become a, a human being and to go to the cross and to die for your sins and mine. That's the love of God, friends. He so loved. The greatest sacrifice that could be made was given. Because God the Son took on humanity and sacrificed himself on the cross. And in that respect, it is the Father who was sacrificing the Son, but it was the Son who was sacrificing himself. Jesus said, I have the power to lay it down in John chapter 10, and I have the power to take it up again. But he had the power to lay it down. He was willing. It was difficult. It was challenging. It was a deep, deep trial. But this, my friend, is the greatest gift that has ever been offered, ever, ever offered, was God giving his one and only son. And that's what it means, his only begotten son. This is the gift of God. Now, just to leave you with a little challenge on that particular passage, is this. The greatest gift that's offered, if it is not received, it is not yours. If you don't take it, it, it you, don't, you don't avail yourself of it. I could offer you the greatest gift at Christmas time or something and say, this gift is for you, but if you, don't, if you shun it and you don't take it, then you don't get to enjoy it. And I challenge you today, have you, have you received... Have you received the greatest gift? And that is Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Have you truly, have you truly received that gift? And so we have the greatest person, God, who so loved the greatest act, the world, the greatest number of people, that he gave his only begotten son, the greatest gift that God could ever give to us, that whoever, whoever, Ha oh, ha, I love that word. Because 
The word whoever means the greatest opportunity. Did you get that? This is the greatest opportunity. Whoever, anyone, anyone. That could be you, my friend. It means it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, where you live, what your ethnicity is, what your, what your preferences are, all these kinds, whoever, whoever, whoever. In the book of Revelation, it says, whosoever will may come and take the water of life freely. Whoever. That includes you, my friend. I praise God that this is true. I thank the Lord for it. The previous verse in John uh, 3.15 says, whoever. Same idea. Whoever. That's you. That can be you. That's the idea here. Whoever. And so we have the greatest opportunity is given that whoever. And, and the next word gives us the greatest condition. The greatest condition. And so the greatest opportunity, whoever, and the greatest condition is whoever believes. Whoever believes. Whoever believes in him. That's the greatest condition is faith. Faith is the, the, the step that we take. Faith is the place where we say, yes, God, I am putting my trust in you. When it says, whoever believes, this great condition is not the kind of belief that the devil has. You see, the Bible says in the book of James, you believe in God, you do well. The devil also believes and trembles. There is a kind of belief that says, I know that these things are true. Most people, well, not say most people, but a lot of people at least who have some respect for the Bible and the truth of the Bible say, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. But that doesn't mean that you're saved. That's not the kind of belief that this is talking about. This word believe means to depend upon. It means to put your trust in. This is the condition that God has laid down. It, it really is the only condition that he lays down in this respect because repentance and faith go together. It means I'm taking myself and I'm no longer trusting in this, that is, my good works, my ability, uh, what I've done for God or, what the, or how good I think I am. I've abandoned all of those things and I said, no, I'm not putting my faith there any longer. I'm taking myself and all my faith is going into Jesus Christ. I'm trusting in him. I'm trusting in him. This is an illustration that I've used many times. You've probably heard me use it before. But it's kind of a good example of, of, of real faith is this. Uh, years ago, there used to be tightrope walkers that would go across Niagara Falls. And so they could go across on a wire. And let's say this one guy's a tightrope walker and he goes across on the wire and everybody cheers. Then he takes a wheelbarrow and he goes across with the wheelbarrow and everybody goes, whoa. That's amazing. Look at this guy. And then he says to the whole crowd there, he says, okay, everybody, how many people here believe I can do it with a man on my back? And they all say, we believe it. Yay. They all cheer. We believe it. We believe it. We believe it. Yep. So then he says to one person in the crowd, he says, okay, maybe the one who's shouting the loudest. How about you, buddy? Uh, well... That's a different story, isn't it? I might believe you can do it, but do I have the faith? You see, that's where real belief comes in, isn't it? Do I have the faith to get up on that tightrope walker's back and walk across, let him take me across that wire? I don't imagine there would be very many in the crowd that would be saying, I believe you can do it. But just suppose one person in the crowd steps out and says, I believe you can do it, and I'm willing to get up on your back. Ah, that's different, isn't it? So the crowd is looking on, and this man gets up on the tightrope walker's back, and away he goes. Once that man is on that person's back, he's got no more say in the matter. He is completely, 100% dependent on that tightrope walker to get him across. There's nothing else. Doesn't matter how many people are in the crowd. Doesn't, nothing else matters now. It's how good this guy is on the wire. If he's good enough on the wire, 
then I'm going to make it. If he doesn't, I'm going down with him. Well, my friend, when it says, whoever believes, this is the greatest condition. That's why it's a great condition. It is in a supreme condition because what I'm doing is I'm saying, Lord Jesus, I'm getting up on you. Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you to be my savior. I'm abandoning the shoreline. I'm letting go of everything else. I'm not trusting in my good works. I don't have any anyway. I'm not trusting in how good I am. That's abandoned now. I'll let everything else go and I'm getting up on you, Christ, and you're the only one that can carry me across. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, my friend, you need to take Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you think that your token recognition of shouting from the shore, I believe, I believe, is going to get you into heaven, it will not work. It will not bring you into a living and loving relationship with God. It is not what faith really is at all. Because the devil knows Jesus died on the cross, and he knows he rose from the dead, and he's not saved, and neither will you be by just knowing these things are true. You can affirm that you know they're true and you still won't be saved. Salvation is where you are willing to put your complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Believe. Whoever believes in him puts your trust in him. This sense of believing is so intimate and so powerful and so real that John chapter 1 says this. It says in John chapter 1, as it speaks about Jesus Christ in John 1, 12, and him coming into the world, in 11 it says, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. It's to those who believe in his name. Receiving and believing are meant to go together, and they actually do. So true faith in Jesus Christ, whoever be be believes in him, Really, it means whoever receives him. That is, I accept him into my life. I accept him as the Lord of my life. I abandon everything else and I put all my hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I tell you, friends, what are you believing in? Oh, I believe in my religion. You'll not get to heaven that way. I don't care what religion it is. I believe in my preacher. The preacher won't get you to heaven either. I believe in my good works. I believe in, and you could make the list and go on forever and ever, and none of it, none of it will work. It's whoever believes in him. The greatest condition of faith. And God can give you that faith as you cry out to him. God, the greatest person, so loved, the greatest act, the world the greatest number of people that he gave his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whoever the greatest opportunity, believes in him, the greatest condition, should not perish. What? Should not perish. My friend, this is the greatest loss. The greatest loss. The Bible says, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What would it profit if you lost your soul? What, does it, what would you give in exchange for your soul, Jesus says. And my friend, what would you give? The greatest loss, the greatest loss is for you to be lost forever. This is what he says, should not perish. So you will not perish. This is what he did it for. God gave his son so that you wouldn't perish. You see, he had an end game. You see, that love was reaching to see your soul, your precious soul, and saying, God saying, I don't want that soul to perish. I don't want that soul to be lost. And so I will send my son. I don't want you to be lost. And the same heart that God has, he has given to me to say to you, I don't want you to be lost. I don't want you to perish. So instead of perishing, God offers something greater. But let's talk up for a few minutes of what that great loss is. That loss is for you to be under the wrath of God. My friend, whether you know it or not, the Word of God says this. In John 3.36 it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And you might say to me, how can God be so filled with love and be filled with wrath? God is filled with wrath and, uh, against sin. Wrath is the holy anger of God. He is angry at sin because of what it produces and, what the, and the destruction that it brings. 
So God hates sin, and he must pour out his judgment on sin. His wrath must come on sin. It will fall on the devil and his angels, the demons. The Bible says hell was prepared for the devil and his demons. And God's wrath will fall on them, and it will fall on them for eternity because there is no repentance in them. But my friend, if you choose to follow the devil's ways, if you refuse to repent and to accept Christ as your savior, then what you're saying is, I choose sin instead of God. I choose Satan's way instead of God's way. And if you continue to do that, and Jesus said, if you die in your sins, you can't go where I am. Now you might say, that's not fair. Why would God do things this way? Because God has to punish sin or he would be unjust. God is a just God and he will pour out his wrath on sin. He must do that. And if that sin is on you, then you will be judged. But God is so full of mercy because God sees the terribleness of your plight. He so loved the world that he gave his only son that if you would believe in him, you would not perish. So what can I say? What can I say? God... It must punish sin. He sees that punishment that has to come on sin. He sees the plight that you're in. So he says, okay, I love these people. I love them so much that I'm going to send my son and I'm going to get him to go to the cross and take the wrath that they deserve. God's wrath fell on his own son. And it fell on his own son so it wouldn't fall on you. Now what do you do with that? What should you do? He's offering you the way of salvation, the way of complete forgiveness, a home in heaven. It's all being offered freely at the cost of his own son being crucified on a cross. And so you can't tell me that God is not love if he is willing to sacrifice his son, that Jesus is not love if he's willing to sacrifice himself so that you would be rescued, so that you would be brought out from under the punishment of Almighty God, He took your place. He took your place. He bought you. So that whoever, that greatest condition, believes in Him, the greatest person, that's Jesus Christ, believes in Him, should not perish, not be lost. Oh, friends, he did it so you wouldn't be lost. He paid the price for your sins so that you can be saved. He has done it. He has already done it. He doesn't have to go back to the cross and do it again. He's not suffering on a cross now. The price has been paid. It is finished. He cried out. And now the call to you is to believe, is to put your trust in, is to put all your hope in Jesus Christ. And if you do, you won't perish. You won't find yourself in hell. You won't be lost. That greatest loss will not be yours. But instead, it says, instead but have everlasting life. The greatest gain. Everlasting life. This is life. Jesus defined this life in John 17. And here's what he had to say. He said, he said this. Um... This is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Life eternal is knowing God. It's knowing God, knowing his son, knowing the father, knowing the son. It's a relationship. And e eternal life starts the moment that you say, yes, Lord, I put my faith and trust in you. It starts the moment that you believe in him as your Lord and Savior. It starts the moment that you say, I've abandoned everything else and I'm putting all my hope in Jesus Christ. And it's a step of faith. It's a step of dependence. It's trusting. It's trusting God. And as you do that, you will never perish. That's what it says. Instead, you have eternal life. Not You'll get it someday, but you'll have it immediately. Immediately. You'll have an eternal, living, loving relationship with Jesus Christ that death doesn't affect one bit. <clears throat> That's why Jesus said in John chapter 11, whoever believes in me shall never die. Never die in your relationship with God. Death becomes that transition door into the glories of heaven. And so eternal life, our everlasting life, carries with it this incredibleness of a relationship with God that happens and that can never be broken. That's the greatest gain, friends. 
It's the greatest gain. And that eternal life only continues in its glory and in its wonder all the way through life and right out into eternity. And the fullness of it is found in heaven itself. And that's great, isn't it? That is so great. So that is what I want to leave you with today and challenge you with is these truths, these great truths that are found in John 3, 16. God, the greatest person, so loved the greatest act, the world, the greatest number of people, that he gave his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whoever, the greatest condition, believes, I'm sorry, whoever, the greatest opportunity, believes, that is, the greatest condition, faith, in him, again, the greatest person, should not perish the greatest loss, but have everlasting life, the greatest gain. So that leaves you with a challenge. Where are you at? Have you truly put your faith? Have you truly put your trust in Jesus Christ? Have you let the shoreline go? Have you said, all my hope now is in Jesus? Now, the truth of the matter is that tightrope walker that's going across, if he fails, then I fail if I put my faith in him. But my friend, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and he can never fail. Let your confidence be found in the Lord, certainly not in yourself. You see, the next verse here, just for a second in closing, in John three seventeen, it says this, For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. And the reason why that is so, in verse 18, it says this, look carefully, he who believes in him is not condemned. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Does that make it so plain? Listen, you're either in or you're out. Which are you? Are you in the kingdom of God? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If you haven't, you're still out and you're already condemned. He didn't come to condemn because we're already condemned, because we're already sinners and we need a Savior. So let me encourage you today to take a hold of this, the greatest verse in the Bible, and own it for yourself. Don't let it just be words on a page, but you personally can come to Jesus Christ right now you can come and say, Lord, I'm abandoning, I'm repenting, and I'm receiving, I'm believing, I'm taking the condition, and I'm putting my faith in you, Lord. And then you will receive that greatest gift for yourself. You will experience that greatest gain, and it will be yours. You will go from death to life, and you will know that you're saved for time and for eternity by the power of Almighty God. You see, once you have the greatest gift, Jesus Christ, once you experience the greatest gain, everlasting life, it will be his responsibility to carry you all the way to the other side. Not only to initially forgive you for your sins by dying on the cross, but to be that living, loving Savior that will get you safely home. And I can say, only say this, if he fails, then I fail. But if he is as good as he says he is, and my friend he is, this great gift will take you all the way home, all through the troubles and trials of life, in spite of myself. He is fully able. The Apostle Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. May God bless you, and may you be able, even at the conclusion of this sermon today, to be able to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And be able to say, I know now that I'm saved because I'm trusting in Jesus. I've experienced and discovered the greatest gift, and now I have the greatest gain. May God richly bless you. Father, thank you for your word. And it's my cry and prayer that today, today someone will be saved. Someone will accept the greatest gift and have that wonderful assurance, that, that step of faith in saying, Lord, I now believe, now I trust you and nothing else.
for my salvation. And thank you, Lord, that that rock can never move, that I'm completely secure in your care. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with a song, Jesus, I am finding out the greatness of your loving heart. It's a song I wrote a few years ago, 20 years ago, actually. But the truth is still good because he has a loving heart towards you. And I want you to know him as your Savior. May you discover the greatness of God's loving heart this very day, maybe in a fresh way as a believer, but maybe today for the first time that you will embrace the fullness of the love of God by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friends, God bless you. Until next time. Jesus, I am finding out the greatness of your loving heart. More and more I understand the fullness of your love. Yes, I know you died for me, shed your blood on the tree. Still I'm seeing more of just how much you care for me. Oh, your love is so real, and your arms are all around me. I am loved by you, Lord, in whatever state you find me. Cause Jesus I am finding out the greatness of your loving heart. More and more I understand the fullness of your love. Before you live inside of me, never leaving though you see all I Yet your love, it changes not for me. Oh, your love is so real, and your arms are all around me. I am loved by you, Lord, in whatever state you find me. Jesus, I am finding out the greatness of your loving heart. More and more I understand the 